After one of the most dramatic weeks in Irish legal history, we've been left with nearly as many questions as answers. Jerry Hutch was found not guilty at the Special Criminal Court of the murder of David Byrne in February 2016. The Regency murder trial and the consideration of the cases of those alleged to have been involved has taken nearly six months. Today, Paul Healy and Michael O'Toole take your questions and try to shed some light on what happened, why it did so, and what comes next. Today's podcast is the first part of a conversation that lasted for a couple of hours. So without further ado, here are the lads. All right, lads, how are you? Paul, how's things going? I'm good, I'm good. I'm well rested now at long last. Yeah, the listeners can't see this, but Paul actually has his hands in an ice bath from his frantic tweeting on uh, on Monday. Mick, how are you? <laughs> yeah, grand. Everything's good. Had a great week. It was fantastic watching and writing about it. Super. Well, for for the listener, I was planning a dramatic surprise, but um, you know, just to let you peek behind the curtain for a second, we've had to redo this take. So <laughs> here we are. Um, but I just wanted to uh, surprise the lads. I was doing a little bit of digging around the podcast last night um, in relation to both YouTube uh, and listens on the podcast. And I realized that since the beginning of the Hutch trial, we have now hit 1 million listens. Hey! So there you are. Wow. Don't let it go to your heads. I can see you. I can see you getting all your feather bowers and turning into full divas and stuff. But no, we're, we're just the start, thankfully. <laughs> How do you feel? Sorry, talk to my wow. agent. You have to talk to my agent. <laughs> You're like the Yaya Toure of the podcasting world. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, that's great news. Oh, we're delighted. That's fantastic. Oh, it- Kudos to you, Kieran, getting them out, and like I, I just I can't believe the amount of people that have been listening to us. So thanks very much. We can't state how grateful we are for people uh, bothering to listen to Michael uh, for that long. I mean, I just don't know how. I don't know why he would want to do that, but thank you. Um, I'm just going to say I'm the 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 elder statesman who keeps the young Buck Healy in check and makes sure we're not sued and gives valuable context. How's that? The system works. The system works. <laughs> All right, lads. Well, after our self-indulgence there, we'll, we'll get to the meat of today's pod. Um, of course, since Monday, this has been you know one of the most dramatic weeks really in Irish legal history, certainly uh, recently. So we put out to the listeners, our very loyal and uh, welcome listeners, to uh, send over any questions they might have in regard to the verdict, in regard to what happens next. So we'll just fire away, first of all. Um, the first one we have here is just in relation to what happens next, I suppose. Is it possible that Jerry Hutch could face different charges in relation to the Regency, such as weapons charges, member of a criminal organisation, etc.? Or is that him off the hook completely? I I think... uh... I think it's highly unlikely that he will face any charges in relation to the Regency. Uh, Mick certainly has had intel and written stories that Jerry Hutch is under investigation in relation to other uh, potential allegations of criminality. But I would be shocked just based off the, I suppose, just the face of it alone, the, the image of what it would mean to charge him again in connection with the Regency. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible because Miss Justice Tara Burns did state in her judgment uh, that it appeared the evidence uh, did show that Jerry Hutch uh, was in control of uh, and possession of the firearms that were used uh, on the 7th of March, uh, on or before the 7th of March. Um, but I think we'll come back to this later, but there is also contradictory evidence uh, in relation to to Jared Hutch as well uh, around the Regency. So there's a lot of question marks there. I, I would just be surprised that there would be any appetite, um, at least in the the short period of time, to go after him in relation to the Regency. That's, that's just my two cents on that, but Mick might think differently. No, I think it's impossible for him to be charged. I, at least mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't notice, see this question coming. I thought you were going to ask about... And we can talk about this about another investigation into into Jerry Hutch. I think it's possible. I think that it's done and dusted for the Regency. And I think even like Jesus, Brendan Gren is is barristers is a formidable barrister. And I think if 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 they even tried this, there'd be a judicial review and everything. So 
I, I'd be pretty happy to say that ship is sealed. I'll have to talk to a barrister. I know about. I know there is, and it's not. I know it's not technically double jeopardy because it would be a separate offence. I, I, I'd be more than happy that it's impossible for him to be charged with anything else uh, over the reasons you know, especially after all the evidence and and everything has come out. So it's a hard no for me. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, it is interesting. Uh, another one here from Kazuchka on Twitter. I, I suspect there's going to be a few usernames that will trip me up today. Is there any remotely reasonable reason why he was charged with one thing that they couldn't prove instead of being charged with handling weapons, being a member or leader of an OCG, for example? Mick, you're frantically gesturing. I'll let you go. Well, I wouldn't. Jesus, Jesus, Kieran, if you think that's frantic, come into the newsroom. Um, what, what would I say? Um, I, I did ask somebody about this. That there, I, I asked an eminent senior counsel, not somebody involved in the case, but an expert on it, because I, like everybody else, I said, well, well, I was wondering, why did they not charge him, you know, with possession of firearms? Or why did they not just say oh, the state's case is that he was involved in the murder or he orchestrated the murder or he set up the murder or whatever? And because you, we're all laymen, we, so we don't really know the law like these experts do. And I, I, got, I got a good answer, actually. It was quite soon afterwards. That person said, look, they had direct evidence from Jonathan Dowdall claiming that Jerry Hutch confessed to it. And really what this barrister said, senior counsel said, once they had that, their opinion is they had to go for it. Now, I still find it hard to believe, but this is from a legal expert who knows their onions. So, OK, I'll, I'll defer to them. I thought it was, I, I, I can see the logic of the question. Maybe they didn't want to water, mud, muddy the waters and they felt they had to go for not only murder, but that he was one of the two shooters. Now, that the, the judges obviously rejected that, but I, I thought it was a, a decent enough explanation about why, why the state did what they did. But on that point, like before they had Jonathan Dowdall, they had him charged with murder. Um, the DPP decided to go with that charge. I think there are question marks really over why the guards didn't pursue other charges. Um, I've tried to get the answer to that as to whether there was uh, um, an appetite or there, there, or whether there were other charges that the guards uh, sought and, the, and that the DPP ultimately decided, no, we're just going with this one charge. Still don't know the answer to that, but certainly we've seen you know, evidence in the case uh, that would have suggested you would have thought that they would have gone for firearms uh, or, or or other related charges. We don't actually know the answer. <laughs> I think it's a legitimate question to ask. Oh, oh it, it totally is. And there's a couple of points. I, I think I'll, 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 I'll defer to you in this, but it didn't. Miss Justice Tarburns effectively say that she believed Jerry Hutch could have had control of, or was in control of the weapons, but that was on the 7th of March. So that's more than a month after the Regency itself. Yes, and, and but then there were complications on in in that evidence in terms of when Jerry Hutch had control of the weapons. Yes, okay, he may have been in control of the weapons on the seventh of March, but there's evidence on the tapes which contradicted the state's case that he was the person in control, the man in charge, um, because of su- suggesting that Jerry Hutch was trying to get the weapons off Patsy Hutch, who who supposedly had them stored in Buckingham Village. And that Patsy Hutch then was in control of those weapons uh, immediately after the Regency. And then where they were before that, there's no evidence either way uh, to determine who was directly in control of the weapons at the time of the Regency. There's no evidence to suggest that Jerry Hutch was. So how do you then connect them to the crime? Um, yeah, perhaps there's other offences there. I mean, Brendan Grehan even said, while he makes no admissions on behalf of his client, uh, perhaps, perhaps there's evidence there in relation to firearms charge but I, I i think you're right i think that ship has sailed i think if they had their opportunity to charge him on that it's gone now at this stage i mean how can you go back and prosecute him and uh, after the fact you know oh i think it would be laughed out of court really do and the other point i just want to make very quickly on this if we go back to patrick hutch the nolly prosecco was entered when he was charged with murder of david byrne we all remember that he was also charged with possessing the three kalashnikovs used in that and that the state didn't do that there. So you would think if the state alleged that Jerry Hutch shot David Byrne and David Byrne was shot with a Kalashnikov, why did they not charge him with you know, you can't shoot somebody without possessing a Kalashnikov? Why did they not charge him with possessing a Kalashnikov? It doesn't make sense to a layman like me. I, I we again we don't know the answer. I've tried to get the answer to this question. Did the guards seek to charge him with other offences? And was the DPP 
the person that uh, the, the the body that made the decision no just one charge of murder um it may well be that the dpp made that decision and the guards were seeking other charges uh, well, well it, well the way it works it's the dpp who decides yes so it is i mean they're I'm the law officers so they're the ones who yeah. decide now look there are consultations all the time I'm, i'll just speak generally you know paul and i cover lots of murders and you'd always hear when a suspect has been uh, arrested you always hear from your sources about the guards are in contact with the DPP. There's a, there's a person on 24 hours a day and sometimes what will happen is if there's admissions or whatever, that that off, law officer, even if it's half two in the morning, will make a direction that the charge the guards charge this person with murder. Other times it will be, right, let, if there's no admissions, right, let's see the paperwork, let's see the file and send the file into DPP. But it is, let's be clear about it, it's the DPP who decides what charges go forward. But there is consultation and there was consultation in this case. Okay, very good. Um, now, the next question is from Stephen, Brian uh, and others. But uh, honestly, I was surprised at how regularly this question came through. So if we don't read out your name, then we do still appreciate you getting in touch. Do you think there's a possibility that Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdell cooked up a plan whereby Dowdell turned state's witness for a charge that they knew they wouldn't be able to prove? Now, um, Paul, I might come to you first, <laughs> given that you were up close and personal to both of them. I want everybody to calm down on this. Seriously, I just think that this is absolute crockery. I don't believe it for one second. Um, I would... I, <laughs> This case, uh, this is going to sound ironic from a tabloid journalist. This case is sensational enough without trying to make it even more sensational. Uh, I, I don't want to accuse people of being conspiracy theorists. I think one person did say I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but and a lot of people have said I've heard this from my friend. I think this is one of these things that just got spread on WhatsApp and it's going and going and going. And people are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense that they, if they conspired together and then, you know, that Jonathan Dowdall, you know, he got a sweet deal for himself and, and Jerry Hutch got off. I, we, I sat there and watched Jonathan Dowdall on the witness stand. I, I, I took him to be a complete waffler. I don't think you could believe a single thing that he said. Um, I would be absolutely stunned if, if in all of this, uh, him and Jerry Hutch conspired together to, to have this outcome. It's the worst possible outcome imaginable for Jonathan Dowdall. Okay, he gets uh, uh, four years in prison. All right, he didn't get a life sentence, but he has effectively a life sentence. His life is over. I mean, no matter where he goes, he'll be looking over his shoulder for the rest of his life. And not just him, his own family. Like he, he, His own family are put in a position here where their lives are potentially in danger. Uh, uh, you know, they, they have to look over their shoulders. That, and, and I just don't see how this scenario benefits Jonathan Dowdall in any way. Of course, it benefited Jerry Hutch in the long run, but I, 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 I just, even the, 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 the way that he behaved in court towards Jerry Hutch, he pointed at Jerry Hutch at one point. I can recall him saying that his life had been turned upside down because of this man. This man is the result of all of my problems. He turned on the Hutches, somebody who was great friends with Patsy Hutch. And uh, he, I did all this for Patsy Hutch. Now he's turning around and saying that the Kinahan Hutch feud was started by Gary Hutch, that this was all the Hutch's fault. If he is in cahoots with the Hutches and then and the, in the exact same uh, sentence is turning around and turn and turning on them and saying they're to blame for the feud that's caused a, untold misery and eighteen people to be murdered. I just don't see it. I think it's a bit fantastical. I obviously I know it, people want to kind of believe it because it sounds great, but I I just think it's complete and utter crap. Did I get my point across? Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of one thing I think is fantastical is the possible risk to Dowdall if he goes abroad and starts a new life abroad. Say, for example, if it was the Kinahan cartel that was going after him, if anybody goes after him, if it was the Kinahan cartel, they have a worldwide reach, and we know that. And we know that the, there is a Hutch crime gang, the superintendent, Detective Superintendent Dave Gallagher from Doc B gave evidence in the trial, and Miss Mr. Justice Tara Burns spoke about the existence and the activities of the Hutch organised crime gang. So they're, they're an organised crime gang, but as I said the other day, the Hutch organised crime gang are nothing compared to the Kinnins. And I know who I would rather have after me. If, uh, for example, if Dowdle goes to Australia or someone like that and starts a new life, I have no doubt that the Hutch crime gang would not have the cap capability to go after Dowdle in Australia. So, you know, that's something that we need, we need to accept as well. If, if you know, 
if he starts his life abroad, I think he'll largely be safe in the, and the Hodge gang will not be able to go after him, really. Are you saying that you possibly believe this conspiracy theory a little bit, that it's possible? No, no, I, no what I'm saying is, I, I, you covered the case, you saw the interactions. I listened to the, the 10-hour tapes and that's grand and he, he Dowdell does come across as a welfare. <coughs> Excuse me. But I did speak to one rather well-placed investigator not on the, the investigation here, but he would have a, a good view of things. And he is certainly very sceptical about it. He's cert- He's not talking about Jerry Hutch. He's talking about Dowdell's activities himself. And he's very cynical about Dowdell. So he would have a suspicion about that, yeah. That Dowdell was playing a game. I, I definitely think Dowdell was playing a game and there, there there are legitimate questions still over his activities in January of 2016 and the, the types of persons that he was hanging about with. He, he's certainly not a squeaky clean individual. He was dealing with some serious figures. Um, and, and even in my interviews with Shane Rohn, Shane Rohn said that the only person that he dealt with throughout all of this was Jonathan Dowdall. You know, Shane Rohn went down to get the weapons. There, I, I'm not saying he wasn't capable of manipulating situations to suit himself. Clearly, he did in terms of he got his murder charge dropped, and that was clearly his motive. But to then take that extra step and say that him and Jerry Hutch were in cahoots and that he then agreed to turn state witness in order to benefit both of them, I just don't see it. There's no evidence there. And also that the threat, the threat of the Kinnahans as well, I don't think that will ever go away. He's on that tape saying that he can make bombs. He's talking about blowing up Trevor Byrne. I mean, I just think I just think he's in a, a highly compromised position. I, w- I, I would be amazed. I would be amazed if they had that level of wherewithal to conspire between the two of them to do that. No, I, no, I didn't say that, Paul. I'm, I'm not talking about Jerry. And I've made that clear. Yeah. I'm not talking about... No, I'm not suggesting you are. I'm talking about no, no, everyone no. else's theory. All I'm, I, I'm just... I, but I do trust this person and mm. this person has a very good overview of mm. things and that person is very cynical about Dowdall and look Paul I know you say this and you're right you know Dowdall is in a bad place but doing 20, 20 years in Port Leisha prison or wherever is as a much worse place than he where he will ever be so Dowdall is a person of interest to me it's, it's just the way, the way he did things and he went from life potential life what, what is the maximum sentence for facilitating a murder is it five years I, I think it is but he got four he'll serve three because he gets 25% remission like everybody else three years in the clink is much better than as we know at the minute life sentence prisoners on average serve 20 years now average means some are higher some are lower but there, um, just this person was very very cynical about what Jonathan Dowdell did for quite a long time and I would suspect that a lot of Guardia are as well. There's there's just a couple of things I would say briefly. Sorry, I, I know, you know, I'm here to facilitate, but just on, on these no, points. No, no, not at all. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is all played on the background of we know what the conviction rates are within the special. You know, this is not a jury case where you're liable to be able to persuade people one way or another a little bit more. These are three seasoned judges. And actually part of the reason that Monday was so dramatic was because everyone was expecting conviction due to the fact, not due to the fact solely, but largely uh, in part, at least because of the the conviction rates within the special criminal court. So that's a massively high wire act that they would be playing there. And secondly, just to reiterate, because I'm, I'm wary that a lot of the listeners wouldn't have been in court at any stage, even just the day that I was there, it was writ large over Dowdle's face, the stress that he was under, the absolute stress that he was under. Now, obviously, you could explain it away that, you know, they're trying to pull this thing off. I just don't believe it. This man was in the middle of a triangle, potentially, between the Hutches, the Kennans, and also the IRA. Like, I mean, this is, this is, it's difficult to overstate the threat to Jonathan Dowdle that was there and that is there now. I, I, I don't understand, I, I don't understand what, what, what your point there is, Kieran. Um, you, you're saying that he didn't have the wherewithal to get himself out of the hole. I think he did get himself out of a very, very big hole. Sorry, just to to clarify, what I I mean is uh, that 
it, it, it's literally just the body language that was on show from Jonathan Dowdle when he was on that stand. I don't think this was body language that was coming from the fact they're trying to pull off some kind of heist. This was someone who is under extreme pressure from having stent, turned state's witness and, you know, it is now in the middle of a, a maelstrom. Yeah, and no, I'm, I, look, I know all the conspiracy stuff and I'm not saying he and Jerry, I want to be clear about that, I'm not saying that for a second. But yeah, but, but Dowdall is bogey and Dowdall was interested in one thing and that was saving his own skin. Is that a fair? I mean, can we agree on that? Yeah, I think that I I think that's that's totally fair and completely that that that's manifestly obvious. Yeah, I mean he and he clearly did stand to benefit, and the judges found that as well uh, in giving the evidence that he did. He got his murder charge dropped, but I just don't know if I would take it that it, to, to answer the questions that we got from several people as to whether he would him and Jerry Hutch would then be in cahoots. I don't see any evidence for that. And, no, no, I don't believe that for a second. Yeah. But I do. There are huge question marks over it all for me. And uh, yeah, look, I mean, you know, Jesus, the judge eviscerated him. You know, so, and, you know, Kieran has made a very good point. The conviction rate is so high. So if you're in Dowdall's shoes and you're facing life, if you get convicted of murder, you're going to start, you know, thinking of ways to avoid that, aren't you? That's all I'll say. Look, I mean, there's some guards who are very cynical about that man. But look, I went through the courts and it, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd say we can, so we can crack on from there. But thank you. Thank you for your uh, answers and thank you again for the question. So this uh, came from uh, someone anonymous on Twitter who uh, says, how were they not 100% certain that Jerry Hutch wasn't in the country during the time of the attack? Surely the Guardi could check passport records. Now, passport records is <laughs> potentially a, a somewhat fraught thing when it comes to Jerry Hutch. So I wonder if either of you would like to say this. You, you can, the, the, the guard. well, they'd have to maybe do a bit of mutual assistance, but maybe... You know, he could have flown in via the north. We know that he uses different airports. You would think maybe they would try and get his phone records or there would have been CCTV. And maybe, you know, I don't know, but I'm guessing that there were none to get or that they couldn't get stuff over the line. You know, you would think that if they had that, it would be a key plank and they would show it. So, you know, Occam's Razor would tell you if they didn't introduce and they didn't have them. Yeah, there was there was no ev- there was no evidence presented in the trial uh, at all either way about the whereabouts of Jerry Hutch, and um, so it's kind of impossible for us to really know ourselves either where he was. Uh, the, the guards didn't present evidence to say we know he was X Y Z. Um, so yeah, I don't really know how to answer the question beyond that. I um, but that was a huge question mark in the case. I kept thinking we were going to get to a point where. On either side, either, either in the defence, you know, uh, that Jerry Hutch would call a witness to say, "Well, I, I was in, I was in, you know, the the somewhere with Jerry Hutch on that day at that time." But there was none of that. And then on the prosecution side of things, there was no evidence. It just simply wasn't their case, and it wasn't up to Jerry Hutch to, I suppose, um, have to explain that. He he only has to, uh, he doesn't have to prove anything. The prosecution only had to prove their case, and that was it. Um, so we're still none the wiser, but I remember Miss Justice Tara Burns did state in her judgment um, that there was evidence on the tape that suggested that Jared Hutch actually could have been out of the country at the time uh, based off the conversations that they were having. But again, we, we've not seen evidence either way. But you know, you know what I'm saying there, lads? Look, yeah. if, if it's a key plank of the state weapon or armory in this case and it's not presented, the logical conclusion is that the they didn't have anything to, that they could, thought that they could bring to the court. I mean, that that's quite clear. Yeah, they didn't even seem to have his phone or any phone connected with him, which I thought was bizarre. But there you go. Yeah. Okay. Um. Now there's a few in kind of uh, you know random enough order here, so I'll just rattle through them. This one's quite interesting. I think it might uh, might let the listeners peek behind the curtain a little bit. Have you or will you reach out to Jerry for an interview? Now that would be a blockbuster podcast, that's what I say. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, but is he going to talk? I don't know. Is he going to talk to us? Probably not. Uh, but sure, if, if uh, Mr. Hutch, if you are listening somehow, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you. But <laughs> it's out of it somehow. Um, yeah, I think he's a cute character. I mean, he only ever did that one famous television interview uh, with Paul Reynolds, RTE, 2008. 
and everybody kind of re- remembers that famous interview because of the way that he carried himself in it uh, and it was, was just extraordinary I think if he's going to do an interview again it'll be something like that I think he'll do a long form television interview um, having said that you know I think he's probably at the moment just thinking how great it is to be um, free and like we were just talking about how in the case he never had to present any any defense you know he never had to get, get up on the stand and and say where he was etc and uh maybe maybe he might decide he's better off not saying anything it was quite clear when he came out of the court that he intended to say nothing he kept his mouth shut the, the amount of questions that were thrown at him was ridiculous i think normally as when you're doorstepping somebody after you don't get an answer on the fifth question you you've accepted the person's not talking but uh people didn't give up because of course uh people are interested in what he has to say i'm giving a very long answer here myself but i would love to talk to him we have made efforts to try and speak to him um but uh, we're also um, i made a decision not to knock on his front door uh, in the residence that he's residing in i think that that's fair given the circumstances. I doubt very much. In fact, I I believe he's not answering the door. Why would he? <laughs> um, I, if he was walking in the street, I think it's fair game to approach him. Um, and maybe somebody will. But uh, efforts have been made on my part. Can't speak for Mick. I'm sure there are plenty of other reporters who've made efforts over the past couple of days and he hasn't so far given an interview. And I'd be surprised if he did. If he does, he does. There's We can't control what Mr. Hutch does and that's it. Absolutely. All right. There's one from Eamon here. And uh, with some of these questions, there are going to be speculation kind of on behalf of the listeners, which we might have to, you know, uh, bear in mind. So uh, how come the DPP and the senior guardy missed so many basic facts in this evidence? It looked to be a trial built on desperation more than evidence. Um, Now, obviously, Eamon hasn't spoken about any particular facts there. So I suppose you might just spool back a little and think, uh, you know, were there anything, were there any aspects of the trial that we felt were underplayed or, or not played enough or whatever that might be? The DPP is a legal expert herself and she has legal experts all around her. And the DPP also regularly, I don't know what happened in this case, but also, but do you remember we were speaking the other day about that celebrity who was arrested for uh, rape and the, 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 the DPP decided not to charge? My information in that case was that the DPP asked a senior counsel from outside to look at it. And they do that. The, the office does that. So, you know, it's not their first rodeo, right? And again, you know, we're not experts in law. We're very good at court reporting and we have a decent knowledge of various things, but we're not experts in law, okay? But they are, and they made a decision. And I can only assume that there were, and, and I do know that there were plenty of roundtable meetings between the senior guards and senior members of the DPP and that's what happened. So they obviously decided, and the law officer decided, this was the route they were going to do. We're not privy to the whole discussion complex, but I don't think it was naivety on their part on this. It was, they made a professional decision. And sometimes it goes for them and sometimes it doesn't. But they are very, very, they, I know from other cases, they, they're, they're, they're very, very rigorous in looking at cases and looking at what's for and what's, to get, what's against. It, it just didn't go for them. It, that's it, really. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to what Mick has uh, said. Uh, I would agree. Um, I think it was a meticulous guarded investigation. I think there were uh, there was an awful lot of, of evidence um, procured. Um, I think they just sought the wrong charge, quite simply. Um, but I think that there's there were bucket loads of evidence uh, in this case maybe perhaps in relation to other allegations and in particular other people. And I think if another person had been on the stand, won't say who they are, but there, there was a, a huge amount of evidence um, where you could probably uh, prosecute a very, very strong case, I would say. And, and just remember, the DPP ordered the, the charging of Jerry Hutch before Jonathan Dowdall you know, ter- became a state witness. So in other words, that was effectively because of the, the tapes and whatever evidence they had. Now, I, I, when I, talk, I, I think there might be a question about this, but for me, Dowdell's evidence was crucial in what the state alleged and the state's case was that Jerry Hutch person, you know, was one of two people who shot David Byrne. So, you know, that changed things. But the DPP had decided 
without the evidence of Jonathan Dowdell to charge Jerry Hutch with murder. So, you know, that should be an indicator. Yeah, I, I do wonder, you know, prior to Dowdell, they were still prosecuting a murder case. So when, when the prosecution counsel got up on the stand and presented the case, um, you know, he said our, our case is that he was one of the shooters. He wouldn't have said that then. What would he have said? Our case is that he plotted the Regency. Was that going to be their case? What was going to be their case? If it, it's hard to, to, to... Well, I can give you an analysis. It, it's called common cause or common common design. So if, say, if the three of us decide to murder Paul Healy for crimes against journalism <laughs> and Kieran pulls the trigger, but I tell Kieran to do it, then I can be done for murder as well. You know what I mean? So it's not just a shooter. Like, if you think... Well, that's interesting because the judges did find that there were problems with common design as well because there was evidence to show um, that he wasn't aware of very key things um, and that he could have been out of the country, etc. I won't re- rehearse it all, but it, she did actually cover that area of common design and that there were problems even with that allegation. So, I mean, does that show us that even in the absence of doubt all, they would have found him not guilty, more than likely? To give another slightly uh, uh, different example, but relative, you know, think about Michael Barr, who was murdered. Three people have been convicted of that murder now, but there were only two shooters. Only two, you know what I mean? So it's so if you're part of a, a group that commits a murder, you can all be charged. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm actually I'm quite raging that you um, have given up our plot to murder Paul on the podcast. That was a bit of a, was a bit of a pain in the ass. And, and I'm also raging that you think I'm in your thrall somehow, but that we'll I know on. it, Bradley. Um, I know it. Anyway, so <laughs> just um, we we now we we got quite a few questions in relation to Patsy Hutch. Now it's worth reiterating at the beginning of this, Patsy Hutch is not before the courts. Um, he was mentioned significantly in the case, and that's worth bearing in mind whenever we get into any of this stuff. One we had here was, has the DPP not already received or reviewed a file on other Hutch members such as Patsy, given that this is the questioner's emphasis, given there's no real new evidence came out in the trial that Gardy didn't already know, I'm wondering how the likes of Patsy could suddenly now be faced with a charge. You see, right, here's the, the issue. We get to hear bits and pieces and you, you have to rely on your sources to tell you things. So there, it may have been, there was a file sent in relation to Patsy. I, I don't think so myself, okay? I have to be honest. So um, I, 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 it may happen. Who knows? Look, you know, yeah, it's pretty strong for a judge to say, for Ms. Justice Terry Burns to, to say what she did. But I don't think, I, I, th- I look, I think their top target was Jerry Hutch. And they wanted him, and I think, I think their strategy was: if the court convicts Jerry Hutch, then we will go for the domino effect, and there'll be other people. Because look, Miss Justice Burns did say that there were twelve people involved in this murder. Murder. So I think the whole strategy was: get Jerry Jerry Hutch first. We'll see what happens after that. And and I'll tell you, I honestly think, you know, maybe. There was a view if the state, if the judges accept Jonathan Dowdell's evidence, which which he didn't. I mean, they did they destroyed him. But I think if they accepted Jonathan Dowdell's evidence for Jerry Hutch, they would use him for several other people. Yeah, it it it's, this is the problem. Uh, the guards have said that the the investigation remains live, um, and they've said that that I suppose to assure the public, you know, are you still looking into this because. You know, certain names have come up in this trial where people have asked the genuine question. For example, Patsy, who we're talking about, uh, why wasn't he charged? But as you've just raised, the evidence in this trial now has been found to be problematic. Well, the evidence of Jonathan Dowdall in particular. Uh, so how do you then turn that evidence back around and, and use it against another individual? You would think they have perhaps a very strong case that that evidence was not accepted. But it the, the tapes... Um, uh, there, there. Are, I, I think there's a possibility that they could be used again. But the evidence of the NSU uh, in the uh, the investigation, um, w- where it led them to the Malahide Industrial Estate, and Shane Roan and Patsy Hutch met up, and the transfer of the weapons there. I think that's very, very strong evidence uh, that was accepted by the judges beyond all reasonable doubt that those events occurred. Um, I, th- I think that's still pretty strong evidence and that could be 
that could be utilized again in a potential future case. But yeah, definitely, I don't see them ever using it. Jonathan Dowdo is useless to them. They'll, ne- they'll never use him again. Not, not a chance. But even that evidence you're talking about, Paul, that's, what is it, ex post facto, facto hot proctor and all that stuff. It's after the event. Really, isn't it? It's after, so could it be a maximum of a firearm, possessing firearms charges? I mean, can, will they be able to prove where the guns were before the murder? That's, I think that's a big issue. I, I think you're right. I think if they had convicted Jerry Hutch of murder, they would have they would have gone after so many more people on the basis of all that evidence. We can use doubt all again. We can use the tapes again because it's been proven in court and, and therefore we can get X amount of people. I'm just trying to figure out the 12 here, the alleged 12 and who they are. Uh... And I think I got up to 11. There's one I'm missing. Um, the Dirty Dozen, as, as they're called. <laughs> didn't, we know the, um, didn't we know back in the day, didn't we have a, a very good idea? Because remember we did the story about 12. Remember I was talking about it the other day that it was, it was, it, look, it was coming from sources on the Kenyan side that I think they had 12 names and I think there was a suspicion that they had identified them all, basically. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm actually trying to talk them up here. I'll come back to it because I want to name them all. <laughs> There's an interesting one here that comes, it's kind of running parallel to this uh, line of thought. If an individual was to be charged, surely he wouldn't get a fair trial. Sorry, this is out uh, on Twitter. If an individual was to be charged, surely he wouldn't get a fair trial given the comments by the judge and the articles in the newspaper. Mick, what do you Okay, think? so Mr. Justice Paul Carney, uh, a deceased high court judge, he was a criminal judge. There was a, an effort in relation to, do you remember the, the Limerick feud early noughties? And the McCarthy Dundons and stuff, and there was a, a, one of the murders there, and it was high profile, and there was an attempt to have the prosecution halted because of prejudice in media coverage, and it was thrown out. And Mr. Justice Paul Carney, God love him, God rest him, spoke about the robustness of the Irish jury, and we should always remember that. Okay, but the complicating factor here is there is no uh, if if somebody else is charged. For me, it's highly likely it will go to the special criminal court, and there, as we know, there are no juries. In the special criminal court. So look, this prejudice is something that we as journalists have to be very mindful of. And my best guidance and the best chats I've had was it's very hard to prejudice something before a charge. OK, uh, Charlie Hawhey uh, was charged with an offence and that was was booted out because of prejudicial statements. But that was after a charge. So the way we always say this, when someone is charged, the shutters come down and, you know, uh, you might want to talk about Twitter in a while, but we always get sort of social media questions about various, you know, live cases at the minute. And it's why journalists like us, we, we are, we, this is different because it's before a non-jury. But we are always very, very careful not to talk about something whenever somebody has appeared in court charged with a serious offence, which we know is going to go to a jury. And that's one thing. So prejudice, people always talk about p- prejudice and stuff. Journalists, I journalists don't prejudice cases because we don't talk about things afterwards. It's beforehand, and it has been tried and it hasn't worked. So, if somebody is charged, my view it'll go to the special and there won't be any issue with prejudice. Yeah, well, look at the case of Jerry Hush. It's a very, very good example, actually, in the end of how uh, the judges cannot be prejudiced. He's been found not guilty. Um, he got a fair trial, um, but Jerry Hush is probably one of the most written about. Uh, gangland figures there is how how much has been written and said about him um he might have been able might have argued i can't get a fair trial because i've been accused of being a mob boss etc and yet he did so that's proof that it does work and i'll also say there are two presiding judges in the special criminal court miss justice tara burns and then mr justice tony hunt he does an awful lot of special criminal court cases as well he's the presiding judge and he said himself i think it was last year there was something uh, maybe it was about media coverage and he goes judges can't be prejudiced effectively that's what he said it's not the so you know judges know their onions when it comes to the law and uh, especially criminal court ones especially so they're quite they're they're always very maybe dismissive or relaxed about media coverage I find because it's they're in charge of the case they have seizure of it I think the words is and they just tend to ignore media coverage really for the special anyway and they said as such uh, said said that in the trial actually that they that they don't follow the coverage we're in an irrelevance to them <laughs> um th- this is an interesting one here that came through anonymously um do you think the tape evidence which was questionable if eligible to be used against Jerry did in fact assist in returning his non-guilty verdict 
not guilty verdict, sorry. Uh, a few times the judge seemed to refer to aspects of the tape that actually proved Jerry had a disassociation with the direct murder. I should say this is the uh, the emphasis of the, the, the listener themselves. Third person references, et cetera, even being in the country, et cetera. I'd be interested to get your take on that. Lad. Yes. I'll talk about this very briefly. Yeah, I agree with Paul. Uh, look, you know, the judge obviously, and just to explain, so it was the NSU surveillance bug. It was fitted in a car in Dublin. The car that went, uh, Jerry Hutch and John and all then went up to Straban via Belfast and they had their 10 hour conversation in the judge. There was a challenge to the northern part of that because it was outside the jurisdiction. The, the judge ruled that it was illegal, that evidence, but let it in. And, you know, so she took the whole 10 hour conversation and it would be very hard to divorce any of it. I mean, she obviously took it as a global package and it's clear that it worked in Jerry Hutch's favour, as you say, the, the third person and all that sort of stuff. So I think the whole tape worked for Jerry Hutch. Yes, I was surprised to see the level of forensic detail uh, that the judges went into in relation to the tapes to disprove that he was guilty of murder. Um, I would have thought that that I mean, I, I mean, I mean that that shows you the the, the 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 level of detail they went into examining this. For to give an example, um, there's a conversation between Jonathan Dowdall and Jerry Hutch. Uh, about what happened at the Regency and Jerry Hutch mistakenly refers to David Byrne as Liam Byrne. And the judges even stated that, you know, if you've murdered David Byrne, if you actually fired the shots that killed him, you're not going to get his name wrong. And there seemed to be several examples of him having a disassociation and not really knowing too much about the incident. And in particular, the aftermath, she said, if you were involved in the plotting, the planning of, or involved in the direct shooting, you would have a, a, a good involvement and interest in the Garda investigation. And yet Hutch appears to be on the tapes asking Jonathan Dowdall for updates as to uh, the Garda investigation, in particular, the raid on Patsy Hutch's home. He knew nothing, or he really seems to know nothing about that on the tape and the search in Buckingham Village. And uh, he mentions, he speaks about who carried out the Regency in the third person. Um, there's lots of examples Um on the tapes to, to show that he just doesn't seem to have the knowledge that he should have if he was so directly involved. So yes, to answer that person's question, the tapes do go a long way towards uh, um, um, assisting Jerry Hutch's case that he was that he was innocent of the of the crime of murder. And can I just come in very quickly now that the dust has settled? We're recording this on, on Friday, so it's almost it's five days afterwards. I just want to say I, I thought that the way the judge really deconstructed. Dowdall's claims about the meeting in the park in Enfield, Enfield in, the way she Ellenfield Park the way the judge really de deconstructed I thought it was fantastic even things you know how could he get the day wrong you know if he, this man had been involved in a murder and somebody had said I did this I carried out a murder or I shot me and another fella shot David Byrne you'd think that would stick in your head you know it's like the whole thing you know I remember where I was exactly when 9-11 happened you know you know there are things that stick in your mind. And I would venture, somebody said, I shot a guy dead, would stick in your mind. So I thought the judge, you know, to be fair, it was really, really, I thought it was excellent, just the whole deconstruction of it and bringing her legal mind. Remember, Paul, I was saying to you about, we were talking about her, that the judge will see things that we never will. And I thought that was a classic example of it. Because she brought all her legal expertise to go, uh, uh, you know, and it was really forensic. And that's from all her experience and stuff. So that it is something that does bear speaking about just the the, the the knowledge that she brought through that and you know, a lot of work for Jerry Hodge anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, huge, a huge amount of, of knowledge. I mean, we were at that, we were at this case every day and we thought we understood those tapes inside out and the evidence inside out and yet she was able to uncover things that are, only when she said them, it was like, it was an aha moment of, oh yeah, sure, that makes sense. I mean, it, I mean, they really did examine it forensically. All right, that's your lot for today. Keep an eye on your feeds over the next couple of days for the next parts of this episode. If you like what you've heard, feel free to subscribe to Shattered Lives wherever you get your podcasts. Speak soon.